Hello friends, welcome to Cook to Nourish. Today I just wanted to do a quick video just talking about my experience with um, the first shot of COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, my experience and then also share a little bit more information that I found uh, relative to COVID-19 vaccine in autoimmune patients. Um, all right, so to begin with, um, so I first, um, I mean, I had my first shot on um, last Sunday and um, I did not have uh, any pain uh, at the injection site, which is surprising because you know a lot of people uh, do experience that. I did not have any, absolutely any pain at the site of injection. However, I did experience an autoimmune flare about six hours after I got the shot. And this is my first shot, right? So uh, around after six hours, my knees, both my knees begin to feel a little bit strange and stiff. And then within you know a couple hours, which would be like around eight hours from when I got the shot, my knees were completely inflamed. They were so bad that I had trouble walking around and I had to be um, in bed uh, for the next like 12 hours because I had really trouble walking. It was very, very inflamed. Uh, however, I did not take any uh, pain medication. I did not take any NSAIDs, uh, you know, paracetamol or um, ibuprofen and I, I just went to went to bed and took rest, drank lots of fluids, and then after twelve hours or so, it began to wane. the The stiffness began to go. The inflammation, you know, like it was like tender to touch and very painful. All that began to subside on its own. And by the time it was twenty four hours from you know when I got the shot, it had really improved a lot. And uh, and then within the next few hours, it had completely gone away and my knees were back to normal. Okay, so I really wanted to share that. I know it's, it's a bit scary that um, autoimmune flare, what's gonna happen whether you're going to, you know, really suffer from a lot of joint pain or um, anything like that. So it did happen, but it was short-lived. So I wanted to, you know, mention that to you. The other thing um, I also wanted to, um, uh, talk about was that some other general side effect that some people can um, experience. And I talked about this um, in my last uh, video. Uh, so definitely refer back to all the side effects, but I also wanted to share something, something else. So basically I wanted to talk about um, a general ex um, side effect of dizziness that some people have after taking the shot. And um, I wasn't really aware of this, that this happens. And um, it was brought to light when I went to take my shot and there was a lady, you know, just ahead of me uh, who had taken a shot and was waiting for the 15 minutes and she actually uh, fainted. So that was like, uh, you know, a little bit scary for me. And that's why I wanted to, I went back and then I researched and I talked to my pharmacist friends who have been administering vaccines from a long time. And what they told me was this kind of dizziness after taking the shot is not unique to the COVID vaccine. It is actually, it happens across, you know, all vaccines. It is a reaction called as vasovagal uh, syncope. And syncope is nothing but fainting. And that is triggered by your blood vessels dilating and that causes a drop in the blood pressure and that causes a decreased blood flow to the brain and that can cause the short very short episode of fainting which is what happened to that person and she was perfectly fine after a few seconds and you know and giving more water and um, um, stuff to her she was like perfectly fine uh, however you know there have been now people are worried when they see things like that so I just wanted to mention that this, this is not unique to COVID vaccine or not not nor is it you know like a common thing that happens in autoimmune patients this is just general for all and then anxiety if you're very anxious and dehydration and all those things can uh, and if you've not eaten anything like low blood sugar can trigger this kind of a reaction uh, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about was like uh, three things right Autoimmune patients are at are not at a higher risk for severe COVID nineteen infection, uh, and that use of biologics 
of which a lot of autoimmune patients are on is not necessarily associated with worse outcomes of COVID. So this is based on a new study that was that just came out. It was done uh, by the New York Presbyterian um, Hospital in conjunction with Columbia University. And um, I will put a link in the description box for all the studies that I mentioned here so you can read you know, those details. But basically that study you know, which looked at autoimmune patients and general patients and compared outcomes that basically said that autoimmune patients um, uh, you know, their outcomes in terms of serious hospitalizations as well as intubation and death, um, that's at par with, um, with the general population. So that means that they are not necessarily at uh, improved uh, outcomes, you know. So that's actually a little bit um, good to hear, right, so for, for us autoimmune patients. It's good to know because you you tend to worry that whether if I get a disease, whether it is going to be worse. So that's not necessarily the case. However, this is based on a couple different studies. And, um, you know, as key more and more data comes, this could change. But based on the two studies that we have now, that's what it says. The other thing was that COVID-19 vaccine is likely to be less effective in autoimmune patients who are on immunosuppressant therapy. And I talked about this in my first video as well, that you know, how patients who are on immunosuppressant therapy, that antibodies are not generated to that effect as uh, they would be if they were not on immunosuppressant. So that's still true. So that's another study that came out, which actually looked at immunosuppressants across the board. And I will, I will show you that in more, uh, more in detail. But basically, it says that it is indeed less effective. You know, the vaccine is less effective when you are on, auto, uh, when you are on immunosuppressant. The other thing I wanted to talk about was that none of the currently available three vaccines, the Pfizer, the Moderna, and the Johnson & Johnson, none of these three have any of these ingredients, which is thiomersal or mercury, human fetal cells, or aluminum or Triton X100. The reason I wanted to call these out was that there are a lot of um, you know, rumors that are being uh, spread on the internet and uh, specifically in social media, et cetera, where people are saying that people who are against the COVID-19 vaccine are talking about that how the vaccines have all these really bad harmful ingredients, uh, but the vaccines, none of these three vaccines that are available in the US, none of these three vaccines have any of those ingre these ingredients, and I will uh, share more details about what is in them. So let's actually go to that. So this is the, I've got, made this table again based, this is available on the CDC website, and I'm going to put a link in the description box so you can actually see it. I've just copy and copied and pasted it from there. Basically, the active ingredient, right? The Pfizer's one has an mRNA, and Moderna's also have an mRNA, which means that it is just, uh, it's just a vehicle. Messenger RNA is just uh, uh, the vehicle that brings that into our body, and the cells, our body cells, then, you know, try to manufacture the antibody um, that relates to the uh, sars cov that is the COVID virus protein, you know, so that it basically, the mRNA just transports that um, viral protein into our cells and then our cells manufacture the antibodies. For J&J, &J, the only difference is it's not the messenger RNA, but it is an adenovirus, which is a type of virus like the common cold virus, uh, which is the vehicle to transport. And again, it does the same thing. It instigates our body cells to manufacture the antibodies against those um, the viral protein. So for the inactive ingredients, this is the list. I'm not going to go at length over this because these are like complicated chemical names, but essentially what you can see, these are some PEGs um, and uh, polyethylene glycol derivatives and J&J &J does not have that. It has a polysorbidate. Another reason why I wanted to quickly share this list of ingredients is that if you have a known allergy, and our sensitivity to any of these chemical ingredients, then you can kind of, you know, maybe wisely choose uh, choose which uh, um, vaccine you may want to get. So, you know, it could be useful for somebody who is 
who is sensitive to a lot of ingredients. So take a look at this chart and I'll also put a link in the description for the detailed article so you can really look at it. But some of most of these um, ingredients here, they are lipid molecules or you know, lipids or um, fat molecules, which are used to, again, as a vehicle to transport that protein. In addition to that, um, now, so see the J and J molecule, the difference is it does not have uh, cholesterol uh, and these kind of lipid molecules. It's a little bit different. In the previous slide, you saw it has polysorbate AT and not PEG. So it's a little bit different. And, um, and it has cyclodextrin, which is another long chain molecule. Uh, but you know there are some slight differences here and there, but essentially the job of all these ingredients are to you know, either to transport as a vehicle or as stabilizers so that a formulation remains stable. Um, and then there are also some preservative kind of ingredients like now uh, the Pfizer one has sodium chloride, J&J also has sodium chloride. Moderna does not have that. J&J has ethanol. So if some people are really sensitive to even small amounts of ethanol, then that could be an issue. And then these are rest of the ingredients. These are all like stabilizers and, and or preservatives. Um, so there's it, but you know, I had heard rumors that it said that a Johnson, they, that Johnson and Johnson's is a better one because they don't have mercury, and the other two have mercury. So that's the one that actually started me to look into it. And you know, as you can see here, none of these have mercury. So that was obviously not um, you know right information. So there's a lot of misinformation out there, but you know, just educate yourself. Um, one thing I will say is that some initial reports do suggest, and this was uh, from the New York Times article that I read. It says that the J and J one, you know, based on initial reports, just say that they have fewer side effects. Another reason they could have fewer side effects is, or one reason they could have fewer side effects is because they have, um, you know, just one dose. Uh, because for both Pfizer and Moderna, the brunt of the side effects or adverse effects occur in the second dose. And because J&J does not have that, maybe it's less. So who knows? But that's the initial uh, uh, reports as of now. The other thing quickly, I just wanted to talk about two studies, which I already mentioned on my first slide that, you know, the immunosuppressants, when you are on immunosuppressants, uh, it dampens the vaccine's efficacy. That was one premise that I talked about in my first um, uh, video. And now there are some preliminary study results that are available from um, the study that was done by John Hopkins. Again, this is preliminary results based on just the first dose of the vaccine. And what they, they you know, measured people, uh, they followed people on immunosuppressants. But remember the immunosuppressants that they were using in this study or they were looking at it uh, at in this study are the strong immunosuppressants like mycophenolate, tacrolimus, corticosteroids. And these are some of the strong immunosuppressants that are used in organ transplant patients. So these are different from the immunosuppressants commonly used in say RA patients patients, right? So methotrexate and um, um, hydroxychloroquine, those are the ones that are commonly used in um, RA patients, but those were not studied here. These are very stronger immunosuppressants. However, the it does suggest that the antibodies decrease when uh, you know, the antibodies to the COVID vaccine are reduced when people are on immunosuppressants like that. Uh, so what that means is that people, immuno, you know, autoimmune patients who are on immunosuppressants, even after they take the COVID-19 vaccine, they are at a little bit higher risk for, again, being infected with the COVID-19 uh, virus because their efficacy of the vaccines is reduced, okay? So we talked about this in my first uh, video, but I just wanted to talk about the study. And one last thing I wanted to talk about was that um, COVID-19 long haulers. If you don't know what this term means, long haulers are people who get the COVID-19 vaccine, but, uh, and they, you know, come out of the acute phase that is in all the fever, chills and all the immediate effects, they come out of it. But 
their body, you know, tends to, they keep suffering some of the long-term effects, which are like very bizarre and strange kind of symptoms, anywhere from headaches, random headaches to fatigue, uh, to neurological, um, you know, symptoms. So those are people who are called as long haulers. And it was seen um, that some uh, in study, um, a recent study, uh, which looked at COVID-19 long haulers who took the COVID-19 vaccine actually saw some positive results where it actually showed that people who were suffering all these long-term side effects from the COVID-19 infection, once they got the COVID-19 vaccine, and after they were done with like their full immunization, you know, both the shots, then they began to experience um, a reduction in all those symptoms that they were seeing that was like related to long COVID or, you know, long-term side effects of COVID, they all began to go away after they had the COVID-19 vaccine. So I think that's very promising. And uh, it was reported from, you know, people across the country who were, you know, suffering that way with long COVID. Uh, and uh, the, began, the symptoms began to resolve as early as even the first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. All right, so that's it. Uh, I hope this information has been useful for you and good luck.